Okay, so hello everybody and many thanks uh, uh, to everyone who is joining us today. Here We are here at Scuola Normale Superiore from Florence. Uh, my name is Andrea Felicetti and uh, I'm uh, an assistant professor here yeah. at Scuola Normale Superiore. And uh, I will be moderating uh, this roundtable in, entitled Blended Democracy, Democratic yeah. Innovation at the Dawn of the Twenties. So today our aim is to spark some inspiring discussion on uh, how democracy, uh, as we know it at least, uh, might be changing before our eyes. Uh, I'm particularly happy about this event because it represents uh, the first time in which we sit together again to talk about one of the core concerns of this faculty, uh, which is democracy. Um, unfortunately, the audience uh, is not here in the room with us today, but of course, we hope and plan uh, on welcoming you back here in Florence in the near future. So having said that, uh, I will take just a couple more minutes of your attention to introduce quickly the distinguished participants uh, of this uh, uh, round table. So uh, uh, left to right from uh, Right to left, um, there is uh, uh, Dr. Paolo Spada, who is lecturer at University of Southampton. And um, Paolo uh, is currently a visiting, uh, um, a visiting fellow in uh, our faculty. And uh, he brings to the table a unique and in many respects uh, unparalleled experience uh, uh, with both the study and the practice uh, of democracy and democratic innovations. So thank you very much, Paolo, for being with us. Uh, next, uh, uh, Professor Della Porta. Uh, the, um, Professor Della Porta is the Dean of the Faculty of Political and Social Science and uh, the leader of uh, the Center on Social Movement Studies. So she is renowned around the world for her extensive work on uh, uh, a variety of topics uh, such as political violence, uh, uh, terrorist corruption, and of course, social movements and democracy. So thank you, Donatella, for the privilege of having you at the table with us uh, today. Uh, further on my left, uh, there is um, uh, Dr. Hans Asenbaum, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University uh, of Canberra. Uh, Hans uh, works on identity and inclusion and on theories of democracy and he is the author of some of the most interesting recent scholarship on these topics. Uh, so Hans uh, is also currently visiting our faculty in Florence, uh, and I'm uh, most grateful with you for being with us today. And uh, last but not least, there is Chiara Milan, um, the, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher here at the Faculty of Social and Political Science. And she's conducting cutting edge work on movements and civil society with a focus uh, on Southern Eastern Europe. Uh, I think we can learn a great deal from her observations uh, on some of the developments in this part of Europe. And so uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Chiara, as well, for having decided, accepted to join us today. Um, so I would, uh, the, um, the round table will be structured as follows. I will first ask a question to our guests and give each of them time for a brief answer. And then uh, um, I will also proceed with a further question and, and uh, I give the floor to them for an answer and, and leave them uh, space for some engagement. And afterwards, uh, I, will, um, I will be collecting input from the audience. So for those of you who have questions for us, please write them down on the, in the chat box. I will be very happy to read your questions, or if time allows, uh, you can uh, directly um, read out uh, your questions to our guests. So, uh, without any further ado, I would move to the first question. I would start from uh, my from my left uh, with Paolo. Uh, so, just a second, and I have I had a, a list of questions. Uh, there it is. So, the, so uh, of course, the topic of this uh, event is blended democracy. We're trying to understand the possible ways in which democracy is changing before us. And uh, the first uh, way in which we discuss the idea of blended democracy refers to the emergence and mixing of new ways of practicing democracy. Um, so 
I wanted to ask you uh, what are the most interesting new ways of practicing democracy that you have met in your work and where does their value lay for democracy? So what's their democratic contribution? Thank you very much, Andrea, for organizing this event. Thank you, Donatella, for hosting us. Uh, so um, I, there, there is a variety of examples. I'm going to talk about the emergence of city level participatory system and um, participatory mm -hmm. platforms. This is something I've been working on for the past 10 years. Uh, and I think these constitute a sort of uh, very interesting testing ground for mixing different democratic uh, devices. I have no time to introduce the language of democratic design, but I'm going to use the language that uh, Michael Soward has introduced in his recent book. Um, and so if you're wondering the terminology I'm using, you can refer to that, to that book. But the first experiment emerged around 2008 in, in Brazil. The city of Canoas is a sort of pioneer example in which the city tried to integrate it around 13 different uh, traditional participatory processes. So they had participatory budgeting, they had consultation, they had open government. And so the, this initial project was uh, very simplistic, uh, was mostly uh, an integration at the level of the administration. So there were like new uh, uh, unit within the city that were formed, and there was a new information system that was created. Uh, since then, we have seen an evolution of uh, these, these platforms, um, in particular, uh, now uh, a variety of European cities have uh, uh, quite developed uh, participatory portal. Um, uh, to, if, you, if you have a time, you can open a window and Google Lisboa Participa to see one of these. Uh, this is one of the platforms we contributed to develop. Um, and so this is a website that integrates, I think, 12 uh, participatory pra practices. There is an integrated login, and then there is an attempt at at least sharing information across this platform. Uh, Milan, similarly, uh, when they built their participatory budgeting in 2017, integrated with their information system. In Italy, there is an online ID that is called Speed that it's used for a variety of e-governance services. And when we were working for Milan, we managed to integrate the speed with the login of participatory budget. So at the moment, uh, these initial sort of pioneeristic uh, integration are mostly parallelization of uh, event and, and, and designs that we have already experimented upon. Uh, there is still little experimentation with entering the black box of each of these participatory processes like participatory budgeting citizen assembly citizen juries and going at the sort of more inner level of mixing you're just trying this platform we're just putting all of these in a unique entry point um we we are starting to see the first uh small attempts at blending um here and there for example um continuous ideation platform that are a platform that allows people to continuously propose ideas uh, and then they have a ranking system then if the ideas achieve the top rank get discussed by by a city, a city government are being embedded in participatory budgeting platform with the idea that participatory budgeting tackles larger type of project and instead continuous ideation platform can reduce the amount of pressure on the public administration by focusing on smaller ideas. Um, and so we have seen example of uh, these attempts, uh, the city of Madrid, the city of Barcelona, Milan, Paris, they're all going toward this uh, integration mechanism. Um, I'm gonna stop because I don't have a lot of time. So the main contribution to democratic theory and practice at the moment, I think, it's really to promote experimentalism and a culture of evaluation. Um, at the moment, a lot of the driver from the public administration are to save cost, to simplify, but there are some, some unintended consequences that I think 
are helpful in deepening uh, some of the typical democratic goods that we care about when we're looking at these uh, invited spaces. Uh, for example, the complexity of some of these platforms uh, require administrative reform. Uh, and so they, they create a new culture inside the administration that shares more information. Um, and uh, it, it also, it, they also promote a little bit uh, a culture of evaluation. Because when you have multiple parallel process of engagement of the population, there will be some that work better than others. And so you will start thinking about the participatory system of the city and start thinking that maybe you should focus more on one or the other. Uh, and so I think those are two of the most interesting things that I see emerging from this specific. I'm going to stop, I think. Oh, perfect timing. So thank you very much for that and for the practical hands-on uh, and conceptual discussion. And uh, next, uh, I will for her. Thank you, Andrea, for blending us. Uh, thank you to uh, Paolo and Hans for having chosen us to spend the blended uh, uh, period of uh, teaching and learning. Thank you uh, to Chiara for participating here. I, uh, I want to go a little bit uh, uh, backward and then also look at how social movements have been living uh, this moment uh, by blending conceptions of democracy more. Uh, I think the first question is important to say is uh, what is the pandemic sociologically a case of? And what I think is important to say is that it is a state of emergency. So I don't want to reduce optimism about the future, but to consider that the type of blending that uh, civil society organizations, social movements are doing and so on, are also in part sort of reactions to a state of emergency, which means that institutional democracy has been blended, to say so, uh, with uh, expertocracy, with uh, uh, the reduction of the space for politics, uh, and uh, uh, with a lot of challenges for those who instead are uh, living inside uh, uh, open spaces, movements, transparency, and so on. So we are living a moment of challenges with less physical and symbolic spaces for participations with less uh, dissent accepted. So the range of debate is uh, uh, narrowing down. There is an increasing selectivity of the argument that can be used. There is a lack of transparency. There is less public spheres and less uh, um, communication instruments that can uh, make the power accountable. There is a strong reduction of rights. There is the military and the police often in the street. There is fear. In short, there is a state of emergency in which uh, important uh, challenges are there for social movements. How did they respond the, on the progressive side? I think they have responded by blending uh, conceptions of democracy. In particular, we have been uh, uh, looking at transformations in the forms of protest, so ways to try to um, use uh, uh, innovative uh, forms that could overcome these uh, uh, challenges that are particularly strong for social movements. Online, and this we are going to talk uh, to discuss later on, but also physically. So the uh, innovations related with uh, the challenge of organizing protest uh, has been met with uh, a lot of uh, transformations. In it. But also there has been other two aspects of social movements uh, that have been used in a very active way, that they are not usually uh, addressed in social movement literature, and these are sort of forms of new mutualism. So the emergence of a very horizontal uh, conceptions of democracies in groups that have been organizing at the neighbor level uh, in order to help the others, but also with the functions of advocacy. And uh, third forms of actions, uh, knowledge building, knowledge productions, which has been considered in uh, during the pandemic is uh, uh, very important. 
So what we have seen in this type of uh, uh, movements has been uh, the capacity to create uh, um, uh, uh, can I say blending, but also bridging frames that has been uh, prompted by the challenge to a certain extent. And so we have been seeing a lot of uh, uh, interactions that uh, uh, has been scaling down uh, at the local level, but also thinking globally. This is an element uh, uh, which is important and it is related with the pandemic as a global uh, uh, challenge. We have seen uh, uh, very grassroots forms of organizations that have um, addressed a particular challenge, which is not only being uh, uh, politically active, but also thinking in terms of pragmatic results, because the pandemics are moments in which you need uh, to uh, also uh, have uh, mm, everyday aims in mind. So concerns with uh, effectiveness. But also when uh, watching uh, uh, in the last few days images from Chile, I think that uh, uh, it prompted, prompted me to think that we need also uh, uh, to think about blending democracies in terms of uh, the blending of institutional conceptions and uh, uh, more uh, um, contentious type of conceptions of democracy. So what happened in Chile with the victory of uh, the left-wing forces it, during a uh, constitutional process uh, has been the capacity of uh, uh, movements with conceptions of democracy in the street, of participation and of deliberation, to bridge with the uh, uh, idea of direct democracy, referendums from below, constructions of new political parties, uh, uh, um, crowdsourced forms of constitutions. And I think all of this will uh, have an impact uh, on the ways in which movements uh, think about democracies, which is, after all, a, a processual and open uh, type of uh, uh, conceptualization. Okay. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, perfect timing for you to add up many thanks. Uh, um, and uh, then I will move on to Hans, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me here in Florence. I'm really grateful to be here. It's a, it's a great experience for anybody who has the chance. It's a great uh, surrounding to do research. Um, yeah, and thank you for organizing this event. So I think it's a it's a great opportunity to um, to engage in this discussion. Yeah. So blending democracy. Um, I was thinking about democratic innovations and how um, these new forms of participation. So that includes um, that includes mini publics, participatory budgets, citizens assemblies, how they can engage in blending and what they can contribute or how they can benefit also from blending. And here, um, I think that democratic innovations in general have been conceptualized in political science, in the political sphere, and they're generally, generally understood as part of a political process. So, um, I think there is a potential in blending and innovating democratic innovations in themselves by extending to other spheres in society. So what can democratic innovations beyond politics look like? And here I think there are really interesting developments in three, three different spheres. I think democratic innovations are extending or learning from science, from the arts, and from play. So two of these are more professional fields. Um, the third one is a more everyday engagement, what children do, what we sometimes do as adults as well. Um, and I think there are really interesting formats emerging or potentially emerging um, by combining, by blending democratic innovations beyond these other spheres. Um, the first one, if we think about science, there is now a very broad field of different labs around the world. So there are policy labs, innovation labs, social labs, transformation labs. And these um, are actually participatory processes, but they're often not um, analyzed by political science because they um, are very well outside the scope of formal political science generally because they borrow and they're inspired by science, by natural sciences. So they think what would a laboratory process 
look like that is a participatory process. So what they do is they invite um, participants to, to commonly construct, to prototype new solutions. So it's something very manual. Um, and that is in a way um, outside the, the common idea of democracy as voting or as deliberation. It is something very manual. So creating new solutions with our hands. Um, and the second um, sphere of arts here, so I've, I've looked at these labs, um, these laboratories together with my colleague Frederick Hanus at the University of Gießen, and we've seen that there's something very inspiring here and we've tried to think beyond these labs. What happens um, if we look at arts and try to enhance creativity um, in new participatory formats? So here um, we propose democratic ateliers, right? So what would a democratic, a participatory space look like? That, um, that invites participants to do arts together or individually, but to work on political questions, right? So it could be a participatory process where you paint, you use clay, you use um, digital art photography to find answers to a political problem. And then third, if we look at playfulness and play, we thought about could we develop a democratic playground as a field where we use games, where we use role play, um, different toys, again, to prototype, to prefigure um, more democratic futures or democratic solutions um, to whatever political problems. Um, and so I think what this also points to, these, these ideas of extending and blending democracy beyond the field of politics, is that there are new forms or different forms of engagement beyond voting and deliberating. So here, um, obviously, there has been a discourse in feminist uh, democratic theory about um, storytelling, greeting, rhetoric, Iris Marin Young uh, here. And that was further developed um, by thinking about listening, thinking about silence as part of participation and deliberation. And um, with Ricardo Mendonca and Selen Erjan, I've tried to think further here and think about um, how, what would sounds, what would um, visuals, what would physical presence or could uh, or already does contribute to deliberation to, in, and also we could think about two democratic innovations as such. And we could even think further about smells, about touch. So employing all the senses in a political process. And I think here these ideas of playgrounds and ateliers really um, come in here in thinking about different ways of blending different modes of engagement and also blending different spheres in democracy. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, uh, many thanks. Um, Hans and Chiara. Thank you. I, I hope you can hear me. So thanks for inviting. Uh, this is a particularly timing topic uh, considering what I'm researching that is uh, citizen platforms and social movements in the Western Balkans. So I will, come, I will contribute with an input on what is going on now in terms of blended democracy. Um, that, uh, and how it has been articulated in particular in the country of um, Croatia and in the capital Zagreb, where uh, the winner of the local election for the city mayor of Zagreb uh, is uh, Tomislav Tomasevic, who is now leading this uh, coalition. It's a platform uh, composed by social movements and traditional parties active on the green left politics, so to say. Uh, so what is new about this coalition and what is particularly interesting for us? Uh, the fact that not only this is the first uh, uh, time in which there is such a young and green left major in Zagreb, but also um, this platform that is called Mojemo, we can, uh, that won the election is a pioneer, pioneer example in uh, citizens' engagement uh, in, a, in a region in which uh, party politics is uh, traditionally articulated, so to say. Uh, what is new is that this uh, political platform, Mojemo, included the citizens in the elaboration of the political program. So not only they decided not just to present their political program, but uh, to the citizens, but to work with them in the elaboration. Uh, they did so by means of neighborhood groups and thematic groups, but also especially by an online survey on the kind of city they, the citizens wanted. Um, so it was possible to participate in this survey online reg by um, registering to the platform 
and suggest uh, not only the, um, the policies they wanted to implement, but also, I mean, the, the problems they wanted uh, to underscore the citizens in the neighborhood, but also the policies they wanted to implement to solve the issue uh, they identified. Uh, so around 10,000 citizens participated, registered in the platform, expressed their view and uh, suggested new um, solution to the issues they, they pointed at. And later on, this was elaborated. What they suggested was elaborated with a team of 200 experts um, accord, working according to um, in thematic areas, so to say. So I think this was an experiment. It was very successful. It was the first time that this happened in, um, in the Western Balkans, although there are some other similar experiments. It is the first time that the citizens were involved in the elaboration of the political program. And this is particularly new, as I said, in a place where there are no such participatory budgeting or uh, citizen assemblies. But usually uh, politics works according to clientelistic networks and so on. Um, so this was also a way to overcome what just um, Donatella termed expertocracy. So to involve experts on defining policies, but at the same time uh, to do so according to what citizens um, express. And this is one of the reasons why the coalition managed to, to win with, uh, I mean, uh, with almost 50% of votes. And, uh, and it's something that I think is pioneer for the whole region. There is a similar uh, political platform in Serbia, in Belgrade, and also they, um, they were consulting citizens in uh, the kind of city they wanted to see. And yeah, this was my, just my contribution because it's something that I found particularly innovative, so to say, in the way in which citizens can be uh, consulted and can participate in the definition of politics. In a time in which, of course, the pandemic also uh, limited somehow the work of neighborhood uh, groups. And that's all. Yeah, uh, very much, Chiara, that uh, fantastic addition in my view. And actually, uh, there is already so much on the floor, perhaps uh, too much for what we can handle in table, but we will add more to the discussion. Um, in fact, I, I thought uh, of this uh, um, of this event uh, mainly um, in relation to two dimensions of the idea of blending. The first one we have already discussed. The second one has to do with the obvious greater role that uh, the digital is playing in our everyday life and in politics. So. Um, so the growing role of online politics is certainly affecting democracy. So I wanted to ask uh, our speakers, uh, what about democracy as we know might be um, destined to change in the future because of this blending um, with the online dimension, the dimension of politics? So we can follow the previous order or if anybody uh, would like to go first, uh, don't be shy. Paolo, would you like to, okay. to go first? Okay. Um, so this is a really giant question that is really difficult to summarize in uh, in three minutes. Um, I'm going to try. I got five. Okay. I think, so the Knight Foundation did a survey of all civic technology, I think it was 2012, and it emerged that the area of expansion of civic technology were primarily those where the market was interested to invest. This is obvious, um, but I think this is an interesting lens when we are thinking about the evolution of this technology because they required a lot of investment. Um, and so I'm expecting that in the race of, of, uh, of the, the evolution of these technologies, uh, we are going to observe that the majority of technologies will be technologies that are designed to sell products, that are designed for surveillance, that are designed for uh, behavior modification. And those will be easily, somewhat easily adapted to certain aspects of politics, for example, digital engagement. Obama and the subsequent uh, election used a lot of these technologies. Social movements now are learning how to use Greenpeace as a lab to use my micro targeting. And so there are some direct applications, um, but I think some of the most interesting technologies are the one 
that are not really uh, developed by the market. Uh, and those, to summarize them, are the ones that promote considerate judgment. Uh, that's a democratic good that you know, I'm tracing it back to, uh, to Graham Smith, but anyway, it's everywhere in deliberative democracy. So with the promotion of critical thinking. Uh, we have seen a general disinvestment in public schooling, in education, and any type of technology. And we had, for example, this year, a great opportunity. Uh, Italy has lost 200,000 students. We don't know what happened to them um, because they didn't have access to technology. When we had the television and the postal service, and so we could have broadcasted classes from the television <laughs> and had done paper homeworks that could be sent by the postal service. There are like, those are types of frugal innovation um, that could have been easily adopted. But again, there is no interest. Italy developed Immuni, that it's an app that is clearly has its root in uh, surveillance technology. And it's designed to trace uh, invisibly if we enter in contact with other people. It has elements that can be easily construed as scary surveillance technology. Um, and so I think that our role as academic and civic innovation innovators is really to promote two things. One is to really try to think the design of basically technology to promote considered judgment. And we know we have some ingredients that have emerged here and there. And second is really to promote what is currently called hacker pedagogy. So the idea that we need to learn how this technology work and we need to be able to reshape these technologies the way we want and, and, and basically become more, more literate in this technology. And so these things should enter our schools, uh, should enter our universities. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there. Many, many thanks, Paolo. Also very interesting proposals in light of what could be do done in the aftermath, hopefully, of the pandemic. Then uh, I would follow the same order as before. And uh, in the meanwhile, encourage our uh, participants from home to ask questions in the chat box in case they would like me to read out uh, their, um, their curiosities or leave them the floor even if possible to ask questions to our participants. So thank you once again, Paolo and Donatella, the floor is yours. Yes, when thinking about uh, your questions, because Andrea has uh, mentioned us what he wanted to interrogate us about, uh, I was uh, thinking, of course, uh, that this is uh, a general question that address all of our activities. What do we want to keep of the digital life experimented with in the pandemic and what, what we want to avoid in the future? And of course, we know that there are uh, a lot of, of pros and cons of uh, the new technologies. This has been discussed uh, uh, well before the pandemics. I was thinking, uh, uh, based on my uh, research and ongoing uh, research by other colleagues on social movements, uh, to think of also in terms of which activities have been improved uh, by the digital uh, option and which ones instead, I think, uh, uh, have proved, uh, uh, or new technologies have been uh, uh, proved weak to address. And I made a distinction in my mind between effectiveness and affectiveness. So I think that's uh, uh, what we have seen also in uh, the uh, ways in which civil society organizations have used them. Uh, an organizational capacity which is improved through the use of new technologies. So they've been good in organizing protests, in organizing new mutualist type of activities, and especially in spreading information. And there has been a lot of work in labs and other things about improving our knowledge, which was particularly important in a moment of untransparency, of uh, uh, misleading conceptions of science, uh, and so on. So I think that's uh, on a lot of aspects, uh, the uh, uh, digital options has been positive in terms of broadening uh, the uh, space by including also options of bridging topics uh, uh, and of uh, um, having a more global vision. 
But I think that also being sitting between Paolo and Hans, <laughs> that uh, now recognizing this type of potentials, uh, I, uh, I can also uh, recognize and stress what Hans was saying about the need to blend different modes. And so uh, uh, he was talking about also smelling and touching, which is something that you don't do through digital means. And there I have to say that my impression is that uh, civil society, social movements, democracy in general cannot be restricted uh, to digital spaces. It is not uh, just a matter of accessing technology, but what we saw is that uh, this large use of new technologies was selectively expanded in some movements but not in others for instance uh, fridays for future used a lot of technologies uh, made by young uh, uh, students the schools were closed they had skills and so on but riders or, or uh, other forms of protest or migrants refugees and so on they, they use some technologies but you need physical spaces Protests are not effective at all on the digital space. I think the, all the e-forms of uh, petition and so on um, uh, are not uh, capable of uh, developing the logics of uh, numbers, damage, uh, and uh, uh, especially not to produce pre the type of prefigurations that comes from the encounter of bodies, smells, uh, touching, uh, and so on. And so what uh, uh, I have the impression that uh, uh, the digital has done has been on the one hand uh, to broaden the reach of some movement, but also restricting uh, the space or substituting physical spaces that I think have to be uh, reconquered in uh, the future to produce uh, real communications, uh, empathies, participations and deliberations. Because I think it's not just a matter uh, of having access to the digital technologies, but also to recognize what they can do and what they cannot do, uh, and how also uh, for some movements, for some types of activities, uh, uh, it is important to return to the uh, physical spaces uh, and to the body rather than uh, the virtual images. I'll stop here. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Donatella and uh, also for uh, some critical considerations about what the digital is doing to democracy. Hans, uh, uh, you're next. Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I actually can, can speak uh, to the point that Donatello raised now. Um, I was also thinking about, I mean, the, the pandemic and our own engagement at home, working from home, having so much you know, experience in homeschooling and all these issues, um, has probably intensified the digital condition. So, the, so the, the 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 trends that were already here, and I think we can understand these trends well um, by seeing these two this interrelation um, of the digital between disruption and mediation. So I think that um, what digital tools do is they mediate what we want to say. They mediate our communications, but at the same time they are disrupting. The physical space that we would otherwise meet in. So we're not smelling um, and touching each other. Um, we're located at different uh, different physical places. And I think that's something that we um, that we um, feel in this event as well, right? So we're talking to an audience that is somewhere far away that we cannot see, um, and the audience cannot be in the same room with us. So we can feel this kind of disruption and mediation because, on the other hand. The event would not be possible at all if there wasn't any mediation. So mediation and disruption, I think, always go go hand in hand. And when I'm thinking about participatory processes, um, I recently was invited to observe uh, the U Eugene uh, review panel, which is a kind of like citizens assembly type of format where people are randomly selected in the city of Eugene in the U.S. and they came together in an online deliberation process. It was so interesting to see um, how digital space, in a way, reconfigured physical space. So often, um, the whole industry around the internet tries to tell us that 
Um, there's cyberspace out there, um, but there's in a way no relation to physical space because um, everything is air, everything is wireless, everything is in clouds in a way. So there's a whole commercial industry behind um, selling us a product that's all air, but actually is very physical. And you could see in this deliberative process how the physical spaces where participants were located all came together um, on camera and they were located in different spaces where they would usually meet for a participatory process. Some were in their beds, some were in their cars, some were in the living rooms. Um, so what came together was a mosaic kind of physical space that was, however, mediated um, through this medium. So I think we need to pay attention to this kind of uh, materiality and the, the physical uh, surroundings that affect participants and then also affect participants who are participate uh, who are in, engaging with these participants and these different um, these different surroundings and this kind of um, mediation and interruption that then results in new types of assemblages new things coming together is also I think at the heart of our own identities how we present ourselves um, in these kind of participatory processes both in social movements but also um, in more structured uh, democratic innovations online um, there are, of course, many examples like the Hacktivist Collective Anonymous that um, through the interruption of their identification um, then create a new uh, collective identity through the Guy Fox mask and through their common actions. Um, there are other uh, examples of online protests where people create creative avatars. Um, so there is a possibility to live other aspects of ourselves um, through this kind of interruption. Um, but I think we need to go even further than this to understand the digital condition, if you if you want to call it. I'm sure somebody uses this term already. Um, and that is that because we engage online, also in our everyday practices on social media and so on, we construct new selves and we construct new re realities online. And we read our offline realities through these online realities in a way. So we construct a certain presentation of ourselves on Facebook, a curated kind of um, self and we read these curated persona of other people as well and then we we read these other people when we leave when we meet them offline again in a different way so we need to consider that um, we now see the world through digitized digitized eyes in a way we are socialized online and perceive the offline world differently because of that and that obviously affects politics and affects any kind of engagement in social movements or in democratic innovations Okay, many thanks, Hans, and uh, yes, uh, Chiara, sorry for being the last one again, but this is order, and uh, please, the floor is yours once again. Thanks. So some reflections about the use of uh, digital platforms and new technologies. Again, I refer to the region of Southeastern Europe, in particular, or the Western Balkans. Um, well, I think somehow they the use of digital platforms or the use of online surveys somehow foster citizen participation because it allowed a great number of people to participate, to express their view online. Of course, excluding those who are not so skilled, uh, but uh, who had the possibility to participate in in-person assemblies, for instance. Also, the use of social media, and here I refer again to the campaign in Zagreb, um, social media worked somehow as loudspeakers for social movements in a situation in which, in a, um, in a field in which they wouldn't find space in the mainstream media. So somehow social media gave the opportunity to, to this kind of citizen platforms to express their view and to, at least in their own bubble. And this was particularly, I think, uh, important for their success. Then when we look at the platform, and for instance, I was uh, wondering uh, of the, those uh, 10,000 persons who expressed their view about the kind of city they wanted in the online platform, I wonder um, how many of them could vote multiple times, for instance, because it not so long time ago with the Monte Cabinet, uh, there was this scandal about the public consultation on the legal value of diplomas in which it was found out that everybody could vote multiple times, and even Donald Duck voted, and Napoleon. Uh, so this was sort of failure for the Monte Cabinet on online consultations of citizens. So there are some tricks uh, that uh, we have to be careful about. And also about um, how much participatory and horizontal are those platforms, 
who owns them, uh, who control them, and one of the, I mean, the most famous one in Italy is the Five Star Movement uh, platform. And um, so um, I will leave you with the question, actually, how much those uh, mechanisms are uh, more typical of social media rather than uh, favoring actual informed deliberation, because I think there is a sort of uh, confusion or overlapping of those different layers. Uh, Okay, many thanks, Chiara. And uh, if anybody would like to take on uh, Chiara's, <laughs> Chiara's question or have a, a discussion among you, you're very welcome to. Otherwise, I already see some questions from the chat. Anybody would like to make a point before we proceed? That if we want to, to take also questions from the floor, it is better that you mention the questions and maybe so we keep uh, a moment at the end. Okay. So I will start with the first one, which is uh, quite, uh, quite a question. Uh, I will uh, read it out for you. It comes from, uh, apologies for perhaps uh, mispronouncing the name, Heinung Legert. And Heinung asks, as far as I understand the, con the concept of multi-channel multi participation or blended democracy, refers to how democratic innovation might be properly sequenced and combined to achieve a more diverse and robust democracy. But how does the already existing blend of democratic innovations with other form of political participation affect this, this perspective? So uh, the participant also gives an exa some examples. A person participating in a participatory budget or workshop might simultaneously be involved in protest Social media and social media campaigns and various forms of lobbyism to influence elected politicians. Um, so that's an example among many. Uh, would not all of these uh, other and perhaps less formal channels of citizen government relationship affect attempts to integrate democratic innovations? So there is essentially a behind the scene uh, of democratic innovation that is very uh, substantial. How does that unfold? Who's the courage to take up? Uh, um, well, okay, if you like so, uh, speaking of blended democracy, I got one from Twitter rather than from the chat. And uh, uh, Chris Bowman um, tweets, uh, blended democracy, that's a new one. Can you define democracy without including majority rule? So how far into uncharted territory you can go without uh, you know radically departing from democracy as we know it so in this blending procedure what's the role for instance of core values traditionally core democratic values such as majority rule so uh, this is a, a challenge that comes from twitter so these two questions uh, perhaps may, over, may already uh, elicit some reactions in uh, in the speakers and if uh, anybody would like to take up either one uh, you're very welcome to i can start with this one because uh, i feel very strongly about the fact that uh, uh, the majoritarian rule is just a vision of democracy mm. one of the many democratic qualities that have to be balanced there is uh, no normative reason to believe that uh, uh, the majority uh, has the right solution. And this is why all the conceptual uh, reflection uh, on uh, the idea of deliberation uh, adds bracket uh, um, forms of uh, decision making, uh, um, which could be consensual, could be ma majoritarian, could be uh, uh, any mix of the two, stressing the fact that democracy is not the moment of counting votes, uh, but it is the moment of uh, forming, debating. And uh, so I think that majoritarian rule is not for me the essence of democracy. The essence uh, uh, is uh, a, a bridging uh, of different rules and deliberation is uh, most important. Uh, and I think that indeed we can discuss and maybe in a second round table uh, in a couple of weeks <laughs> about uh, uh, the specific contributions of uh, um, blended democracy 
in the way in which we have been thinking about it, to deliberation, to forms of operative democracy. Because I think that all what Paolo was saying about information and so on is indeed relevant. Uh, but uh, not by chance, most of the successful developments that we have seen in terms of democratic qualities, uh, for instance, in the examples I was looking at in Chile, are all uh, uh, in uh, cases in which uh, there have been uh, different um, conceptions uh, bridged, blended, uh, uh, and considered, as I mentioned. Referendums have clearly a majoritarian logic, but we know that referendum can bring about uh, low quality democracy if they are not accompanied by uh, other forms of uh, encounter uh, uh, discursive qualities. Uh, that uh, participation is a most important way of socializing to democracy. But that's uh, what the pandemic also says, that effectiveness is also important. And for this, you also need to bridge the moment of uh, uh, discussing with moment of the people. If I may, I would uh, add to this that the blending that might be taking place seems uh, somewhat to challenge some of the old fixation about what democracy needs to be uh, found for not just thinking, but also happening. But yeah, the floor is yours. If anybody else uh, has uh, some thoughts on uh, these two questions. Uh, yes, please. Paolo. So uh, the first one that uses the multi-channel language that we introduced and we got heavily criticized uh, for the predates the idea of blending. Um, I think there are two ways to see that question. One is just uh, a, an evaluation of, of the quality of democracy. And so uh, basically looking at the system, the components of the system, I'm not gonna take it that way. I'm gonna take a more practical uh, standpoint and I'm gonna put myself in the shoes of a designer that needs to optimize um, a participatory system at the city level or at the state level. Um, at that point, I think, uh, considering and, and leaving space uh, for uh, basically serendipity and uh, uh, meaningful inefficiencies as some, uh, some people have defined them is extremely important. And so when, when you are designing, you can activate new channels with the objective of targeting a specific subset of the population with a specific objective, but you're constantly knowing that there are lots of other things going on at the same time. And, and so that some of, of the things you're going to create are going to interact in innovative and unexpected ways. Uh, so sometimes you actually want to eliminate channels. And there is one of the most cited examples is Porto Alegre, in which they close all the channels of lobbying uh, toward the uh, budget of the city, and they forced everybody to participate in participatory budgeting. And that, according to some people, was the correct way to do it. And it really pushed uh, the process. So when, when you are inter intervening in a live system, you have to be cognizant of what is going on. And also what's important is to dialogue with the social movement and the citizens, because the level of complexity is such that you might activate a channel that enters in conflict with somebody else. Like there is a maintained assumption that there is a sort of summative approach of the of the blended approach. The more we do, the better. And it's actually completely wrong. Uh, we have probably more example of blending that went wrong. Uh, for example, activating a digital vote that created conflict with the face-to-face -face vote or uh, introducing a mini public that was not integrated with the general discussion that bypassed the social movement and the social movement got really angry. So. I think it's it's really important to start from the design stage. At that point, you are involving in a mature way the public. They're going to tell you what they want. They're going to tell you, we are already doing this in this other space. So we would like the city government to introduce another space. That we can promote. Yeah. With the side of your eyes, you might have been looking at the questions that arrived because... Mm -hmm. and from the University of 
Sandra asked us, um, who will do the blending in a blended democracy? Is it the designers of democratic innovations? So who is the actor? You know, you talked about the designers. And also she has uh, stated to this, maybe we can talk about bottom-up versus top-down blending. So this is for food for thought in case uh, any of the speakers uh, would like to points. Uh, I see it's the University of Canberra. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was thinking the same. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Celine, yeah, um, yeah. I think it's an uh, it's it's a really interesting question because very often when we talk about democratic innovations, we somehow assume that they are designers, but they are very much in the background. So we, as academics, often lead these conversations where we say we need to include the people, we need to do something that this and this happens, but the actual actor. Um, very often remains in the dark and it's not explicated who is who is that actually so I think it's it's an excellent question and I think when we when we reflect on this question the obvious answer is the demos right so the people need to be the ones who are um, designing who are producing and that's the idea of claimed spaces right so invited spaces are those that are produced uh, by some people for others so these some people need to think then what is the best way of other peoples to participate? But claim spaces, the idea is to think, how do I want to participate with others together? So this is a democratic idea of giving yourself your own rules in a way, in a group. Of course, you have to consider others. So I think a, a really interesting thing, uh, interesting way for democratic innovations to think forward is to think about how can common people who don't have um, expertise in design or in democratic participation, how can they be included in designing these processes? Of course, there are certain skills might need to be required, but as academics or as people who have resources in this regard, we can also provide the infrastructures to invite other people um, to participate in these processes. And the question of um, top-down versus bottom-up, I mean, yeah, I've, I've partly addressed this already, um, but yeah, the, the question of blending is, of course, uh, what what blends with what? So if we want a democratic blending, we have to think about what are the democratic components and who are the actors um, that need to be included in this process. Many thanks, Hans. Uh, also, in your case, you might have been reading our chat because there was a question from a colleague here at Scuola Normale Superiore that says engaging uh, is Hans Horg trends. Uh, engaging in forms of blended democracy often requires quite sophisticated skills and competences. Is there a new digital divide of skillful and unskillful citizens in democratic engagement? So it, I think it's very much related to what you were saying. Now I would like I will invite people from home to um, not ask further questions because unfortunately there might not be time. Uh, um, yeah, for another round table. If there are some concluding remarks uh, uh, from one of our speakers, uh, you're all very welcome to share them. Oh, not from and, uh, no, just uh, the, the, the remaining minutes. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, also the distinction between uh, uh, the uh, experts and the common people uh, should be, uh, how can I say, nuanced. Uh, because uh, what we see is that there are a lot of uh, activists, uh, democratic activists, that are neither the experts uh, as we uh, know from previous uh, uh, experiences of top-down forms of uh, development of democracy, but are not the common uh, ignorant uh, somehow mm. citizens uh, that uh, uh, other conceptions of democracy have in mind, but they are already uh, skilled uh, and uh, experienced because uh, all these forms are starting uh, to become a sort of patrimony uh, of uh, uh, heritage from other social movements. So I think also the example that Chiara was uh, uh, giving uh, tells us that uh, uh, this reflection is already embedded in uh, movements and so on, so that may, uh, uh, maybe they are already empowered enough to develop their own uh, type of ideas and uh, 
uh, that uh, experts can, of course, um, participate uh, in the blended uh, uh, blending, uh, uh, but uh, in a context in which all these ideas are already very up. And uh, so I think we can we have to conclude it here on uh, this uh, final note. Uh, as participants from home uh, have understood this um, uh, roundtable it's itself, it's sort of uh, a blended mode uh, and uh, a way to keep doing what uh, we do for work, which is thinking about democracy and studying the idea. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, it's been uh, a tough year for many. And uh, but we hope that in the forthcoming months, uh, we can uh, welcome you in person to Florence. Uh, and this uh, gives me an opportunity to thank once again, uh, Paolo and Hans, uh, especially for uh, having joined us in this, uh, in this uh, circumstances uh, and uh, also thank you once again Donatella and Chiara mm -hmm. for accepting the invitation and uh, so goodbye uh, to the participants from home and uh, have a nice day or evening. Thank you Andrea, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.